First of all, I mean, white do not have a carbon content. I mean, biodiversity, you know, very biologically diverse ecosystems happily have higher carbon contents of monoculture tree plantations, but because the plantation industry is now trying to manipulate the rules, we will end up in a system in which it's basically much more efficient, much more profitable to just plant straight rows of trees instead of, you know, supporting for example, biologically diverse uh, forest restoration uh, by, by communities. I mean, it's just a matter also of economies at scale, etc. Those things will get less money. Now, what they sometimes attend is that if you have good policies at the national level, and if those national policies are coherent with other international instruments, like the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the Convention on Biodiversity, then you can prevent a lot of bad things happening at the national level. That is, as long as you insist that you have a nation, nationwide approach and not a project-based approach, a sub-national approach as they call it. So that the money goes to the country, government, and they will then distribute it. However, there are very few countries in this world we get really where there's a really good relationship between the government and indigenous peoples. So indigenous peoples have very legitimate fears that that kind of system they will lose out too because in the overwhelming majority of tropical countries, you know, indigenous peoples are marginalized in national policy making. And that the World Bank is, you know, formally bound to supporting law and also international conventions. So they should try to make sure that whatever they set away is in line with these other conventions. But for example, in Paraguay, where I'm based, I mean, we had this whole case in which there had not been any consultation with indigenous peoples. This is violating the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. We've been alerting World Bank staff about that before the project proposal from the Paraguayan government was approved. We've been telling them, listen, this will violate the UN Declaration if you approve this. Friends of us were at the session where it was approved. The World Bank doesn't, staff doesn't have any say in this. This is a committee of other countries, and it was the other countries that basically approved it, even though it violated the UN Declaration. And the World Bank is now saying, oh, we couldn't help it, those were the other countries. But of course, that kind of money does a lot of damage. You know, and that's why we feel there should be absolutely binding standards for any kind of red, sta red money. That it's not just going to you know, carbon sequestration, it should support coherent rights-based policies. Even then, within there, there's a lot of you know, dubious things. On the one hand, on indigenous rights, you don't want to know what kind of things are being called participation these days. You know, they pick out a couple of friends that happen to be indigenous, you know, the indigenous individuals that the United States try to put in the text here, and, you know, they give them a little bit of money and then they say, well, you know, indigenous peoples benefit from red schemes. I mean, it's sometimes as corrupt as that. Um, you know, and it, that happens on the international level too, where a couple of, you know, indigenous institutions are now getting a lot of money and, you know, promoting the message that indigenous peoples can benefit from red schemes. Yeah, they can, sure. I mean, you can make money out of everything if you're clever enough. But the big question is, will the costs and benefits be divided equitably and how, what will be the cost? What we see as costs already happening in countries like Paraguay is, for example, a negative impact on land rights claims because the conservation organizations now see they can make a lot of money out of that potentially, so they make sure that indigenous peoples do not have claims over their own forests anymore. And you see these tensions already growing in many countries, so this is getting very serious. There's a lot of costs to these schemes, and then even a couple of benefits for a couple of you know, indigenous people and indigenous institutions is not the same as equitable benefit sharing and equitable sharing of the cost. Equitable benefit sharing is should, means that, for example, a Noah Kempf project in, in, in Bolivia doesn't just give a couple of dollars to the local communities. No, that something is done to the fact that the benefits of that project are not divided in such a way as they are at the moment in which the Nature Conservancy and the corporations involved in managing the project get 50% of the proceeds and all the local communities and indigenous peoples together get 2%. That is what we mean by the quest for equitable benefit sharing of these kinds of schemes. On the other hand, so this is what we call the false participation, the false, you know, trying to deal with indigenous rights. On the other hand, on the biodiversity, there's a 
side there's an even bigger problem that there's still so many people inside the countries and also at the international level that think that biodiversity conservation can be done by setting us out, you know, 2,000 hectares of land for monoculture tree plantation in which nothing grows, in which pesticides are being used, in which, you know, all the plants, all the birds, everything is being cut away. And on the side they put a little buffer zone of say some 400 hectares and that's the biodiversity. That's the protected area, you know, and they will always show nice photos of the birds there, etc. And that's how the big tree plantation companies do it in Brazil already, in which you have 80% of the land totally wasted, totally destroyed, and they set up a tiny little reserve of 20% of this land, and they say, we do biodiversity conservation, look at our beautiful protected area. And this is devastating. Most of all for the people who depend on biodiversity, for the women who divide them, the pen of biodiversity because they can't go into the tree plantation which is poison anyway because of all the pesticides being used and they cannot go to the protected area because of course that area is protected against any indigenous people or other people coming in too so they're being excluded from the entire countryside and they have nowhere else to go than to the city slums.